This is Manhattan Insights, a Manhattan Institute production. The extent of job loss and the speed of job loss in spring 2020 was just dramatic. And of course, the book details what we did to keep borrowers in their homes and get the market running. And it also details some of the reasons that the Federal Reserve came in and bought mortgage-backed securities to kind of stabilize some of that. But by the summer, certainly by July or August of 2020, we were in the strongest period of probably job recovery ever. There really wasn't a, a strong rationale in August 2020 for the Fed to continue to buy mortgage-backed security. I'm Raihan Salam. When the pandemic hit in 2020, Many were concerned that we would see not just a health and an economic catastrophe, but a financial one as well. The mortgage market in particular looked very vulnerable, with over 20 million jobs lost in just a few months. Market experts were expecting large mortgage-based bailouts of banks. One of the reasons we didn't see this mortgage crisis was our guest today, Mark Calabria. Mark was the director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, the overseer of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the federal home loan banks during the pandemic. He'll be interviewed by my colleague, Judge Glock, a senior fellow and director of research at the Manhattan Institute. They're going to talk about Mark's new book that he wrote while he was a senior advisor for the Cato Institute, Shelter from the Storm, How a COVID Mortgage Meltdown Was Avoided. So... You, one of the great parts about the book is you talk a lot about America's current kind of Rube Goldberg housing finance system, which you know about as well as anyone. Uh, can you explain just a little bit for our listeners what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are today and maybe a little bit about how they differed from what they were in 2007 and 2008 before they were bailed out the last time? Great point. And a little bit of the early part of the book does try to walk the reader through, you know, how did we get here today in this, in this again, crazy situation? So, um, Fannie and Freddie buy mortgages from lenders who originate those mortgages. So, when you want to go get a mortgage, you don't go to Fannie and Freddie. You would either go to a depository like Chase or Wells Fargo, or you could go to a non bank like Rocket, Loan Depot, many of these types of companies, and they make the load. They may keep it in the case of depositories, or they may sell it, uh, and they could potentially sell it to Fannie or Freddie. And then Fannie or Freddie wrap that into an MBS mortgage-backed security. Most of the time, they give that MBS right back to the person they bought the mortgages from, and then that person sells it to the capital markets to a broker-dealer. And so this is the growth of the secondary mortgage market. In the grand scheme of things, it's a relatively recent, uh, pre, 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 before the 1980s, it was pretty rare. It wasn't unheard of, but it was pretty rare. Um, both before the 1980s, most loans, you'd go to a lender, they'd make the loan, they'd keep it on their books. And then, of course, the savings and loan crisis kind of blew that up and changed that model when Feeney and Freddie came out of that. Uh, Feeney and Freddie failed in 2008. They were taken into conservatorship, which is an administrative bankruptcy. You think about it kind of fairly similar to Chapter 7, where the purpose is to fix them and, and, and rehabilitate them, rework the balance sheet if you need to put them back out. Uh, unlike your typical bankruptcy, they've been in it since 2008. Uh, it, that's not necessarily the way the law was intended, but it's the situation the way it's played out. And as I also discuss in the book, a really big change in the mortgage market has been the growth in non-bank mortgage lenders. And I mentioned some of these like Rocket or Loan Depot. There's a whole host of them. Previously to 2008, if you went to uh, a lender, got a loan, let's say it's Chase uh, or, or Wells Fargo Bank of America, something like that, uh, they would originate the loan. That is, they'd make the loan. Uh, and then they might sell it or they might keep it, but they almost always kept the servicing. And the servicing of the loan really quite simply is the administration of it. It's the, it's the entity that collects your check and forwards, it forwards the payment on to the investor. And this played a really critical role in the crisis. Because post-2008, this marketplace has been, for reputational and regulatory reasons, taken over by non-banks, which have a very different set of risks uh, in balance sheet capacity relative to the depositories who used to dominate this business. Uh, and by contrast, you know, if you, uh, for instance, live in New York or California, and you're predominantly in the so-called jumbo market, that vast majority of that market really is, you go to a bank, they make a loan, they keep it, and they service it. And there's only a small amount of securitization in that market and ends up working very differently than the Fannie and Freddie market. 
Yeah, so just to, to clarify, too, so a lot of people woke up around 2007, 2008 and started reading all of these articles, uh, uh, the terms that were thrown around at the time that I were kind of used ad nauseum, I got sick of, were about slicing and dicing mortgages and mortgage tranches and so forth. But I think one of the things that, that may surprise a lot of people uh, post-2020 are all these different sort of groups that are now so substantial, uh, and as you said, a relatively recent part of the mortgage market or a growing part of the mortgage market. So basically there's these originators, often non-banks now, as you pointed out in the 2010s for the first time, non-banks made the majority of uh, mortgage loans, originated them. So these are the guys that first start off with a mortgage, make the loan to the individual. Then the, the servicers that they collect the, the checks and pass them on uh, to the final owners and the investors. And so this kind of tripartite mortgage market is, is kind of our current situa situation. And that's largely mediated by Fannie and Freddie. Is that right? It exists because of Fannie and Freddie. So most of these non-bank lenders, again, uh, they don't tend to have balance sheets. Um, they tend to rely on the financing of others. So the typical way it works out is you go to one of these lenders, you uh, would you know close on the loan, it typically takes them 30 to 90 days after they close the loan to sell that loan to Fannie and Freddie. That interim is actually financed by the depositories by something called a warehouse line of credit. So rather than Chase making the loan directly, Chase may be funding like Rocket for 60 days until, until Rocket sells the mortgage and then they get the MBS and they sell it all. And none of that would exist without Fannie or Freddie, because the reason that the broker dealers and, and others are willing to buy the MBS is because Fannie and Freddie have wrapped a guarantee around it. Now, the tranching that we saw in, in pre-2008 in much of the private label market really was a different way of trying to get a credit enhancement. This is the, you know, Fannie and Freddie provide a wrap of their own. You know, is that implied guarantee? Is that something where, uh, you know, there will be a bailout or not? And of course, we saw the government step in and help Fannie and Freddie in 2008 at that time. So there certainly is that perception that there may be a rescue, whereas much of what you saw in the private label industry 2008 was an attempt to create credit enhancement, you know, private sector-wise. Uh, and so you so you do have a mortgage market today that is very much driven by the presence of Fannie and Freddie. They, they are the gorillas in the room. They do drive the market in a very big way. They have a lot of market power, uh, and they, they you would have a very different market if they were involved. Yeah, so just to, you pointed out in the book too, it, it's important to emphasize the size of, of this mortgage market and how substantial this is, not just for the American economy, but kind of in, in the global financial system. Uh, I, I think you pointed out that by most measures, the, the U.S. mortgage market is the second largest fixed income market on earth. Absolutely. There's U.S. treasuries and then there's mortgage-backed securities. And then when you start going further down, you might get the things like Italian sovereign debt. But uh, the MBS market is is just incredibly huge, tremendous amount of turnover. Uh, you keep in mind that you know the mortgage market itself, you know, is probably ten, eleven trillion dollars. About seven or eight trillion of that will be mortgage backed securities. And so again, this is just a tremendous market. Its uh, assets, debts are held throughout the financial system: banks, insurance companies, REITs. Uh, you know, obviously the Federal Reserve, big order of mortgage-backed securities. So it really is an asset that that's held throughout the financial system, which obviously leads to a tremendous amount of interconnectedness, but it is an incredibly important asset class. And so one way to think about this is, you know, the outstanding debt of Fannie and Freddie, you know, is bigger than the combined capitalization of every of all the companies listed on NASDAQ. Um, and so again, and this is obviously, we've spent a lot of attention to the equities markets appropriately. Uh, but again, there's a huge footprint from Fannie and Freddie. Of course, the NASDAQ cap will differ from day to day. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think I, I looked up some of the most recent numbers. So like you said, the uh, the mortgage-backed security market, uh, it's around 12 to $13 trillion. The treasury market around $24 trillion. Of that mortgage-backed security market, we're looking at about $6 trillion from Fannie and Freddie. And I think some people might be surprised to hear that that has gone up substantially since the 2008 mortgage crisis. Some of us who are- yeah, The other, yeah. <laughs> they blew themselves up and at the end of the day, it worked out better for that in terms of a bigger fight front.
It, it wouldn't be the first time for a government agency that a uh, failure brought a bigger budget and more uh, responsibility, but uh, it is Might kind of shocking more. in this case. What? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The, the, uh, the, ex- the rule, not the exception, definitely. And, you know, this is just part of a, a, a general massive federal intervention, the mortgage market that goes everything from the Federal uh, Housing Administration to the Veterans Administration, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There's Ginny May, which we didn't even get into, the Federal Home Loan Banks, which were actually part of your ambit uh, when you were uh, the director of the FHFA. Uh, There's also the people who oversee it, the OCC, the Fed, the FDIC, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I recently saw even the FTC had a particular focus on mortgage fraud. So the the kind of, I already mentioned Rube Goldberg, but I think we need another more complicated sort of machinery metaphor to describe that there's so many different factors on this. And as you mentioned, a lot of this is aim at giving credit support to mortgages for, for precisely these these concerns that the, the private label mortgages were trying to get around pre-2008, that what happens if they default, what can they do, how can government support that? As you say, without all of those kind of it's, contemporary government support, there's no way the modern mortgage market in America would exist. It, that, y- yes. You know, we don't have, uh, and we didn't have in 2008, a Wild West mortgage market. We have a massively regulated and subsidized and distorted mortgage market. Uh, you know, part of it is, of course, that mortgages tend to be long dated. I mean, you know, we sure most people don't hold a mortgage for 30 years. The typical life of a mortgage is seven, eight years, probably closer to 10 in this environment. But even the 10 years, that's a long dated asset. And if you're funding yourself like deposits, which which as we've l- learned recently, Silicon Valley Bank or rather relearned, they can they can be flighty. So there is a duration mismatch between mortgages and funding in the in the in our financial markets. Um, this used to not really be the case before, say, the 1970s. Before the 1970s, there really wasn't a lot of credit risk in the mortgage market. You know, if you were what we think of as a subprime borrower in the 19 pre, previous to the 1980s, you just didn't get a mortgage, to be frank about it. Or if you did, you paid 50% down. And so you have seen efforts by the federal government to essentially water down mortgage standards uh, over time. And you've got an increasingly credit risk that has entered the system. That was a big deal in 2008. It's a big deal now. Uh, but the interest rate risk from mortgages really is a, a critical component that often gets a lot of the system in trouble. And of course, that's what blew up the savings allowance. And to some extent, obviously, that interest rate risk is coming back to bite a lot of banks today. And a lot of these yeah. banks are holding uh, agency and treasury securities that are, are susceptible to that. One of the things I thought was interesting, your book published, obviously, before the most recent banking crisis, you noted uh, some banks have even failed due to holdings of U.S. treasuries. And maybe just a year ago, that would have surprised some people to read that that was could be a dangerous asset, depending on that. But we've obviously seen that with Silicon Valley Bank and other banks. Yeah, I mean, well, you know... Uh... But I, I, there's part of me who'd like to say, I told you so, but I would derive so little pleasure from that. Uh, but there's a lot in the book that, as you said, I mean, the book came out the week, you know, the week following SVB failure, uh, obviously it had been written and finished months before. And so I do think it's quite timely. There's a number of things in the book that, you know, really point out current events, even though the book was written some time ago, because these are topics and issues that, that come back pretty regularly. And then for some of us, you know, we could see some problems coming into the mortgage market. And I did one reason I wanted to write the book was not only tell the story of what we did right, but to also kind of raise the alarm about problems that I was seeing in our financial system, in our mortgage market uh, specifically, but also the widespread holding of mortgage backed securities. You know, I spent a lot of time on the phone with the Fed and others uh, in over the years during the crisis saying, you know, I'm really worried about all these FBS holdings on bank balance sheets. Of course, you get a bit of a polite nod from the, the other regulators like, yeah, that's interesting. And then, of course, here we are. Is there is there much the government can do about that? So, I mean, one of the interesting things, I, what I've written about the history of, of federal intervention in the mortgage market is that there was all these attempts to insulate these banks from risk and you know, insulating them from the liquidity risk. The ability to trade them was a big part of it, like you said. It was very hard to trade mortgages uh, with these short-term liabilities like the bank deposits uh, if you had these 20, 30 year mortgages or even like 10 year average mortgage maturities. Uh, So the government, uh, you know, made them liquid, tried to make them equal by giving these guarantees, tried to make the credit sure by guaranteeing the uh, either the whole mortgage backed security or the individual mortgage and all of this. Is is there much the government 
can do kind of like I see now the concern is like how can we insulate banks from this last risk they might actually have to take on which is this interest rate risk and you have the Federal Reserve saying now hey we'll eat your bad uh, treasuries and long-term MBSs and we'll give you a a, you know we'll charge you a certain amount on this but you don't have to worry about their value decreasing because to my mind it's like well this is the only thing the federal government hasn't insured or guaranteed before and now they're trying to do that do you think there's anything they can or or could do about this long term and are you concerned about that kind of eating up that last attempt to make the private sector absorb some risk i am concerned because i think it's moving in the wrong direction i mean certainly what the government could do is stop doing so much damage and of course you know i'm of the view that you know the federal reserve you know sure to remind ourselves between February and April 2020, you had about 22 million job losses over two months. And to put that into perspective, in the Great Recession, you had about just under 9 million job losses that spread out over two years. And so the the, the extent of job loss and the speed of job loss in spring 2020 was just dramatic. And of course, you know, the book details what we did to keep borrowers in their homes and get the market running. And it also details some of the reasons that the Federal Reserve came in and bought mortgage-backed securities to kind of stabilize some of that. But by the summer, certainly by July or August of 2020, we were in the strongest period of probably job cre- job recovery ever. And, you know, it, there really wasn't a, a, a strong rationale in August 2020 for the Fed to continue to buy mortgage-backed securities. And so to me... Uh, much better uh, plan than cleaning up messes is don't don't create a mess in the first place. And there really just was not a, ra- a strong rationale in my mind for the Fed to keep its foot on the on the gas in terms of the mortgage market. You know, we were really concerned about you know from a stability standpoint about the the air that the Fed was blowing into the housing market in 2020, and clearly the price is going up insanely in many areas. And of course, there were some other reasons for that. You know, people moving from San Francisco to Boise and things like that that also distorted prices. But the Fed was adding fuel to the fire in a way that was simply not necessary as a stabilization. So first, don't do not do any harm. Could be should be the first government mantra, but of course, we, we without one, it gets ignored pretty regularly. But I do think we could have a system. First, I think the biggest problem is there's this perception that if the government guarantees the rest, the risk just kind of poof, disappears. It's it's gone now. The government doesn't have it. Well, what, what it actually has done is either transferred it uh, to the taxpayer or transferred it somewhere else within the system. And so to me, an important thing to keep in mind is a mortgage, like any other asset, is going to sit on somebody's balance sheet. Even if it's an MBS, that MBS is going to sit on somebody's balance sheet. So at the end of the day, we should ask ourselves, do we want that to sit on a strong balance sheet or a weak balance sheet? And historically, we have chosen to put it in a weak balance sheets. So to, if they keep in mind before the growth of Feeney and Franny and even before the growth of the savings and loans, you know, you go back to the 1940s and 50s, most mortgages were held on the balance sheets of insurance companies. I mean, as you've probably seen in some of your research. And lo and behold, you know, the duration of the typical life insurance policy is actually not that substantially different from a mortgage policy. So I do think we had better avenues of financing uh, this in the past that were much more stable. And that's why I think to some extent, even though, you know, we had housing booms and busts in the 50s, you know, 52 to 53 was very brutal, you know, 71 to 72. I mean, so we've had periods. I mean, we sometimes lull ourselves to think in the housing market is stable. And at least in American history, we have housing booms and busts all the time. And of course, the housing boom bust of the 20s was a very big contributor to the, to the Great Depression. I know you've uh, written about and talked about. But the point being is that for much of that period, you know, it wasn't devastating in the same way in terms of the way we've connected it to our financial system. So I really think the big mistake we made as a policy matter was, again, starting in probably about the 80s where we decided, okay, we're going to connect the mortgage market even deeper into our capital markets. And that has made it systemic in a way which it was not before. And and, uh, an issue that certainly played out in the 2020 uh, pandemic and the crisis that you had to respond to. So we've been kind of dancing around the the main story here, but I think it's important to get to it. So maybe this is too broad a question, but how does a a nice free market or libertarian economist, I don't know exactly how you develop self-defined, but someone who is is definitely more on on the free market uh, end of the spectrum, 
end up leading and in some sense managing or regulating two of the largest owned government owned corporations on earth and why did you think this was a, as a good job for a free market economist to do and how did you kind of i guess the the next follow-on question will be how did you square that circle but interesting how did you get to be the the director of the federal housing finance agency it, it does seem to have relied on a series of coincidences <laughs> if, you, if you if you will but as you mentioned, I had served some time on the Senate Banking Committee staff. And during that time, I worked on legislation in 2008 called the Housing Economic Recovery Act that created the Federal Housing Finance Agency. So I had the ability to work on the statute that created the agency. Ian, you know, being an economist and also somebody who's, who's very free market leaning, it was created in tr- and it was it really was an attempt to try to create a regulatory structure to control the moral hazard that government guarantees or create. So as an economist would say, it was absolutely second best. This was not first best. This was this was second best, maybe not third or fourth best to, to, to admit it. Um, and so it was really kind of how do you take, you know, you make, how do you take a bad situation and, and make it better? And so, of course, after leaving the hell, I spent a number of years at Cato. Uh, and then there was a, a you know, outreach from uh, Mike Pence's office, and and again to be his chief economist for two years, where I mostly worked on taxes and trade. Uh, so I hope our New York listeners don't hold it against me that I did work on the salt cap, which I thought was great, really great policy, but um, a different, unrelated issue. And so when it came time for the administration to pick someone to do this job at FHFA, there there were a number of other competing candidates. In fact, I think five people. I was one of five people considered. Um, you know, I was the vice president's choice, and I think many others kind of, uh, you know, saw me as an obvious risk because I had worked on the statute that created the agency. I had spent a lot of my time working on mortgage housing issues, uh, and so I, you know, I was in the unusual spot of knowing the subject matter really well, knowing the industry well, really well, without necessarily being captured by the industry, and that's really a big problem in public policy, which is. How do you get someone to regulate an industry who knows enough about the industry to be effective and not too heavy-handed, but not also captured by the industry? And so it's 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 a fine line. And, and admittedly, there are very few people who can kind of do that. I also felt so. For instance, I mean, you know, I was being considered for one of the Federal Reserve spots, and I just felt that for me, here's an opportunity to run something. I don't want to take away anything from my friends at the Federal Reserve, but you know, being a governor on a board is not quite the same thing as being they had of an agency. Uh, so for me, the attractiveness of running something, having worked on the statute and, and having a clear vision of what the statute and what the mission of the agency was, and having something that, you know, I was attracted to going somewhere where there was something broken that needed to be fixed, you know, and, and, I, and I guess maybe that's a personality defect, or maybe it's just I like to be challenged, or maybe I felt like, well, the, the 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 up there's there's only upside given how bad it is. So roundabout way of saying it's really the set of topics I've been working on for a very long time, and so I had very strong beliefs about it. And I do think, and this is a theme of the book, which is I think bringing a skeptical of government, you know, public choice kind of constitutional libertarian type perspective, actually made me a better regulator than I would have been otherwise. And part of the theme of the book is to counter, you may remember, and I, I mentioned this at the end of the book when George W. Bush in the 2008 crisis said something like, you know, we must abandon capitalism to save it. And I make the argument in the book that that's wrong, that, that, that really what you want is if you think about crises as that sort of fog of war, of why being principled gives you a better path to behave in a crisis that you actually have a roadmap rather than just responding in an ad hoc manner uh, without any sense. You know, we still to this day don't really know why Lehman was treated one way, bear to the other. And maybe we'll never really know why SVB was treated one way and First Republic slightly differently. And so to me, the the the, the, the just the book is we're better off having principled people in government and how and you and principled people, particularly principled small government people, can make a big difference in government. You know, you have to accept what you can achieve. Uh, and I think that that really made it a very successful. And so I talked, for instance, the book, how we took a troubled agency with deep morale problems, whereas you could imagine their politics of the agency 
stack were very different than my own, but we were still able to turn the agency around, increase morale, and, and get people focused you know, on doing something in a very cost-effective manner. And I think it allowed us, that one reason why we crafted uh, mortgage relief programs in 2020 that worked in a way that they did in 2008 was because they were informed by good economics, getting the incentives right, uh, being modest about what you can achieve, and being targeted about what you can achieve. So quite frankly, I think having, you know, I think of libertarians as the opposite of utopians. Libertarians, at least my own libertarianism, is being realistic about how government actually operates. And I think because I was realistic and thoughtful about the way government operates, I was able to operate it relatively well. I should certainly say the theme of the book is not, you know, government would be great if we could just get our own people there. <laughs> that's that's not that that's not the theme. The theme really is that you know, you, you you should be able to get involved. You can make a difference, but these things are, are are somewhat structurally flawed. And I try to talk about in the book, you know, the trade-offs that I face, the uncertainties I face, the frustrations I faced. Uh, but again, I want I put that out in a way so that people know what they're in for if they were find themselves in a similar position, but also to have an optimistic take up. Get involved. You can make a difference. Yeah, one of the things I appreciate about the book and one of the things you and I have talked about before is the necessity of telling people who care about free markets and who care about economic liberty to be concerned about government. It's often a difficult pitch, but uh, in the old words of Trotsky or someone else, uh, to paraphrase, even if you don't care about the government, the government's going to care about you. And it's very That's important to, to, to be involved in this. And you'd much rather have someone who has maybe someone closer to your sympathies in charge of this than someone who looks uh, for a top-down solution for everything. Uh, so, so maybe take a, a, another step back and just to clarify, one of the reasons I think even someone like you and me who may be more suspicious of regulators writ large in the financial system would see this regulator, the FH, uh, FHHFA, as so essential is precisely because of the strange nature of their charges. The Fannie and Freddie, which are before 2008, were semi-private corporations uh, that got a wink, wink, implicit guarantee from the government that everyone agreed created the sort of moral hazard that you identified in 2008. Post 2008 became effective government owned corporations. And so this was what I was mentioning before uh, about you kind of, well, managing or regulating. Uh, we can talk about the the exact verbiage here. But, but what did you do and how was your relationship with the companies? Because the companies are still companies, but the yeah. majority share, shareholder is the federal government, uh, and in that sense, you are representing most of the shareholders as the FHFA director. Or is that true? Are you just implicitly part of your job as regulators to make sure the interests of the federal government are being watched out? There are a number of interests there, but you know, before we get into that, do you want to emphasize? I mean, I mean, I think that certainly there are going to be parts of the government where libertarians are simply not going to necessarily do well. There are parts where I think you can do well. So, for instance, you know, I wouldn't have a generous system of deposit insurance, but we have it. And if you do have it, it creates more hazard. So you need a regulatory structure to, to offset that moral hazard. And again, it's the same thing with Fannie and Freddie. I wouldn't have created these entities. Uh, but certainly one of the things that made my job easier is, you know, I think of myself as an Article I constitutionalist, which what what I mean by that is it's not the regulator's job to think about whether these things exist, that's Congress's job. So one of the things that made my job easier, and it may be fine and appropriate for me as a um, commentator, pundit, scholar, what have you, to comment on should Fannie and Freddie exist, but as the regulator for Fannie and Freddie, that's been decided. That That's no longer your job. Your job is to enforce the law as it is. And if you can't do that, you don't take the job. Uh, and of course, you, you don't do things you think are unconstitutional or illegal, at least not intentionally. Uh, but focusing on the relationship with Fannie and Freddie, you've had this weird situation where you're both regulator and conservator. So you're essentially the bankruptcy judge, if you will, while also trying to be the regulator. Now, it looked like to me when I walked in the door that my predecessor had kind of, you know, threaded that needle by simply not being much of a regulator and taking the view of, well, you know, the regulator criticisms of supervision are criticism of the conservator, so we can't have that. Uh, and it was definitely a push and pull. And, you know, I, I think I say in the book a little bit, I joke at one point that it took me six months to stop saying we in reference to Fannie and Freddie. And you've just seen such a complete erosion at the agency because of the length of the conservatorship that there really isn't a, a separation of thinking. I mean, yes, 
you know, the conservator and the regulator will tell the the companies what to do on many of occasions, but the companies don't always do what you tell them. Um, they're very vocal on expressing their point of view often, and there are shared sets of assumptions that may or may not be in the public interest that are shared between the regulated and regulatee. So it's not necessarily a nefarious type of capture where people are going from the regulator and working at Fannie Mae the next day. It's more a cognitive capture of there's a shared set of assumptions about how the markets work and how the companies work that may not necessarily be true. Many of this isn't true and is often you know counter to the public interest. But again, it's it's become it becomes in the air, if you will. Um, so it was interesting to deal with the companies. Uh, you know, um, I guess I can put it this way: at one point. During the writing, my editor says to me, uh, Mark, you know, on one hand, you're occasionally quite complimentary of the G of the Andy Friday. On the other hand, you're quite critical. And I'm like, it's complicated. And, and, it, and it really is. Um, they were frustrating to deal with. Sometimes they were encouraging to deal with. And I'd really try to take an approach to the book of here's what they did well. Here's what they did poorly. Here's where I think they can be approved. Um, and here's probably where, you know, there's no fixing it. And so I, I do on occasion express frustrations with some of dealing with them on occasion. Um, but again, I give them credit and some individuals at the companies that did some good things. But, you know, the this cons the conservatorship has really eroded a sense of independence from the regulated versus the regulated. And, and again, maybe it makes it sometimes everybody feel like they're in the same boat, but it really kind of distorts uh, the regulator focusing on its job and taking its job seriously in the same way. Um, but yes, uh, by law, they're still private companies, even in the conservatorships are considered private companies. Uh, so you are, in one hand, running two large multi-trillion dollar private companies while at the same time trying to regulate them. Uh, but certainly one of the things that I did early on was to tell the supervision staff, listen, you know, don't pull any punches. If you see something, say something, just because we're the conservator does not mean that the supervisors stop doing their job. Uh, I think the the companies were probably you know, a little taken back. I mean, I, you know, I, I have a habit of being quite candid, you know, when it when it's merited, and they didn't always like hearing that. Um, they certainly didn't like being reminded that they were essentially in bankruptcy. They kind of had gotten used to it and felt like it was back to normal. So it was a really you know weird world of. Uh, lack of real division between the regulator. And I relate a, lot, a couple of stories and anecdotes in the book that really were just shocking. So I would say there's a narrative sometimes out there that Feeney and Freddie have been quote unquote fixed being in the conservatorship. And let me tell you, that's a hundred percent not true. Um, they are arguably uh, in some of the worst shape they've probably ever been in. We did build capital. So I should note when I walked in the door in April, 2019, they were leveraged a thousand to one, which you know, you don't survive a strong wind to that kind of leverage. So we were able to start building capital in fall of 2019, which really worked out well because when I walked to the door, they had six billion in capital to support six trillion in risk. Uh, and their losses from COVID was that we're in the neighborhood of six to seven trillion, six, seven billion. And so they would have failed had we not started building capital. So part of the theme of the book is we actually saved Fannie Freddie from feeling in 2020. And you know, we since that since we wanted to make sure that was a story that was understood, so we could avoid perhaps them feeling in the future. But there was definitely a lot of push and pull with the companies, a lot of frustration working with them, but a lot of positives and a lot of optimism. So that said, it's a complicated story. Uh, I think it's important for the government for the federal government to to reprivatize them and get them back out of conservatorship. It's just such a distorting situation for everybody involved. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so. So before the pandemic hit, you weren't even the director of the FH, uh, FA for a year. Is that correct? Well, 11 months. I was 11 there. Months. 11 so, months. Pandemic hit. So. And so you had had some time to build up some capital. That was one of your main pushes you describe in the book. And obviously that was absolutely essential to making sure that these institutions didn't fail in that crisis, which would have been near inevitable if they had had that thousand to one leverage uh, that you had mentioned before going into early 2019. But when the pandemic hit, let, let's get to, to that crisis immediately. One of the things that surprised me most in the book, and I'm sure I read about some of these demands at the time, but was the pervasiveness of the demands for several different types of mortgage bailouts at the moment. And if you poll people publicly, and if you just ask any Joe on the street, 
obviously there are a few things less popular than bailing out financial institutions with federal money. And yet you point out numerous instances where the Financial Times, where numerous different uh, articles and in, in presses and uh, newspapers were demanding that you bail out <laughs> different sorts of financial institutions. And so the amount of pressure that uh, you were under at that time, uh, it was somewhat surprising in retrospect. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the servicers? So we've talked about the kind of tripartite mortgage market and how the servicers are the ones who feed the uh, the payments, the interest, and the principal back to the investors, and why they were screaming bloody murder in 2020 that they needed some federal money to survive. So you keep in mind that we set up forbearance programs for borrowers. And again, the forbearance programs, it wasn't forgiveness. You still have to pay your mortgage, but, you, but we press pause on your mortgage. Now, during that pause, you weren't paying your mortgage. You were going to pay it back, but you weren't paying it during the pause. But in many instances, the services were still required to use their own funds to forward that payment to an investor. Now, I say many, not all. Uh, and so for certainly for some services, that was going to put a stress on their liquidity. For others, it was simply less profitable. They often uh, profit on the float between the time of payments and the time they remit those payments to investors. And so certainly this was going to be something the um, services would have preferred to have some government financing now. And this is also at a time where everybody and their brothers seem to be getting rescues. I remember... Um, one time walking out of Treasury Secretary Mnuchin's office and walking past me on the way in was Doug Parker, CEO of American Airlines. And I do think there was a sense in the mortgage industry of like, why does everybody else get bailed out, not us? Well, first of all, I didn't have anything to do with all the other bailouts. So, you know, they 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 they, they drew the bad luck of the draw. They drew the one regulator who wasn't um, automatically going to rescue people without question. But part, more importantly, we we simply were looking at the data. So um, Fannie and Freddie at that time did business with 346 non-bank servicers. I had balance sheet and income statement data on every single one of them. Uh, we got on the phone with the 30 largest immediately just to make sure that the data we had wasn't stale and accurate. And so we really tried to make sure, well, is there anybody really having stress? And then I walk through the really numbers in the book on why we ultimately concluded that there wasn't a systemic crisis among the industry, that there were maybe half a dozen that were kind of riding the line. And any one of them, we had the ability to transfer their service into someone else and keep the market going. So we simply didn't see, need, need, see a need for a bailout. But I think this is particularly topical given, you know, Silicon Valley Bank and other ongoing activity. That's not 99% of the uh, you know pressure I was getting, whether it's from the Financial Times or whether it's from the Federal Reserve, was you know let's bail these guys out. You know, in for instance, you know I was on the phone pretty regularly with the Federal Reserve at that time. Governor Lyle Brainerd was the point person on the mortgage issues. He's now at the White House. I mean, I talked to her pretty regularly. We would walk her through what we were seeing, and she was very clear of like. Mark, we've got a we've got a rescue system for these guys set up and ready to go. We just need Treasury to say turn the key. And of course, the sense was mostly correctly that uh, Secretary Mnuchin was getting this information from me. So the Fed felt, well, we could get collaborators to say it was okay. We can get Mnuchin to say it's okay. But you know, they had no data or analysis. The Fed was just like you know, as I call it, uh, win in doubt, bail it out. And there really was you know. So part of the reason I wanted to write this book was. We said no to bailouts in this case based on the data. Uh, we turned out to be right. And uh, I, that's that's such a very different narrative than what you hear all the time. And particularly in today's environment where we're told this bailout, that bailout is necessary. I wanted to really kind of reassert the narrative of these are all bailouts of choice. Some are actually made with data analysis. Some are not. Uh, and we based ours on data and analysis, but I also wanted to give the reader what it feels like to get that constant pressure from one side that you need to rescue people. And if you don't, then you know the financial services industry will make sure that their allies in the press say nasty things about you. Uh, that was actually one of the fun parts to write the book, going back and reading all of the uh, very kind and generous things that were said about me in the press when I said no to bailouts. And, you know, surprisingly enough, almost very few, you know, press statements in support of saying no. Uh, so it's really interesting how quickly the the financial press kind of rode to the, of course, we need a bailout. And I think it's partly because, you know, 2008 and, and the environment post-2008 has really set up this narrative, a pro-bailout narrative. And again, you know, the theme of my book really is 
you can help Main Street, you can help families without bailing out Wall Street, that, that you can do it directly. And maybe to put this in, in numbers of context, um, it's not just the programs we worked on, but we what we designed was copied by FHA and copied by most private sector lenders. And so compared to 2008, we helped twice as many people. We did it six times as quickly, and we did it at a fraction of the cost. You know, so you can be, you know, compassionate, helpful, and frugal at the same time. And none of these things are in contradiction. But we did it by rejecting rescue in the industry and helping families directly. But also, you know, in some sense, making sure the way we helped families was well coordinated. So on one hand, we didn't want to have the paper chase that characterized 2008 where, you know, borrowers would have to fill out all this paperwork and sometimes it was fraudulent, sometimes it wasn't. It would take months to get to the program. We looked at this and said, there's a pandemic. We're going to take people on their work. We're going to let people tell their servicer they've lost income. We'll put them in the program. We'll call them back three months later and check on them. So we're very generous on one margin, but we were able to be very generous on one margin because we were going to be stingy on the other margin, which the other margin was, we're going to make you pay it back. You know, this isn't forgiveness. This is a pause. And we also set up other sets of incentives. So normally, if you were late on your mortgage or you're in forbearance, you have to go a entire year when you're out of, of on-time payments before you can refinance. So once this, you know, record interest rates hit that everybody wanted to refinance in 2020, we said, well, you know what? If you pay everything back and you get current for three months, you can refinance. So we created a really big carrot to get people back on their feet. And then the other part of this, you know, I, I kind of call this the Casey Mulligan effect after Professor Casey Mulligan at University of Chicago. Casey did a bunch of work post-2008 that really argued that the jo slow job market recovery coming out of 2008 was a, because of an expansion, massive expansion of means tested programs, the core of which was the mortgage assistance programs. And it essentially 2008 worked that you got 31 cents uh, of mortgage relief for every dollar you earned. And the flip side of that, of course, is for every dollar you earned, you lost 31 cents of mortgage relief. That's just the mortgage. So I looked at this and said, we needed to set up a program where we didn't penalize people for going back to work. So instead of having it means tested or having high implied marginal tax rates, and this again gets back to the earlier conversation, I don't quite want to say we should have economists design all of our programs because history has shown that that's not necessarily the most trustworthy thing either, but making sure you get incentives right. And so the fact that we created a set of incentives that on one hand was very generous, on the other hand, you know, it was incentive compatible. It made people want to repay and, and graduate so they could get the carrot at the end of the stick. I think wrote really well. And again, that was, again, the big difference between this and 2008 was really, I really took the role of borrower incentive seriously in a way that I don't think was taken in 2008. Definitely. And it, well, one of the things I, I was curious about too, reading the book is that obviously you were put in uncomfortable position of having to make these decisions. It's in some way, I imagine you would have preferred not being, having, being the person to have made these decisions. And when, when you had to take these more, you could call them interventionist, but maybe that's unfair because everything the, the sure. Fannie and Freddie were going to do at the time was an intervention. They were, they were acting on the mortgage market as government conserved semi-private, semi-public companies. But when you had to make these sorts of decisions, uh, what did you look to when you had to make decisions about, say, forbearance, which is, hey, there's, there's not really a private market in this situation. How do I decide, you know, what to do? You, as, as you partially, you have to look at the numbers. You have to make the decision, as you pointed out, over the long run. A lot of the private sector imitated uh, these decisions, but did you also try to look at what the private sector was doing, what had happened in the past, and some extent? Now, you did end up, you know, for, you know lucky coincidence that, you know, I had been pretty obsessed, you know, my time on the banking committee and my time at Cato and initially really looking at the 2008 response and really looking at that and saying, boy, if I ever get a chance to do this, I'm going to do it a lot differently because that was a mess. Then as fate would have it, I did have a chance to do it. And I think it's highly unusual that you've had somebody who has spent a lot of time thinking about a particular problem and then they're in a position to do something about it, and the problem comes back. I mean, that was highly unusual, and I don't think that's why I would say the, mis the message is not if only we could get our own people in government. It really was a set of unique circumstances that, that, if you will, put me in the right place at the right time. 
the issue that, that you know I've already mentioned of how does someone with you know a free market bent uh, uh, run a government agency and what are kind of best practices? Now you've already mentioned one, which is as an article, a strong believer in Article One of the Constitution. You thought that adhering to the the laws written was essential, not only because it was the legal thing to do, but as you also pointed out in those chapters, it was an effective thing to do. And why, <laughs> why do you think that was is so important, how you were able to lead the agency? I mean, I think it's, it allowed me to focus because, you know, if you spend a lot of time as an agency thinking about things in which you don't have control, you're reducing the bandwidth of your brain power and your attention on things in which you do have control. Uh, and so don't get you know, don't get dragged down dead end alleys, you know, focus on what, what is your responsibility? What is it within your control? Uh, and don't spend your time on things you can't do anything about. So to me, it allowed me to better manage my time. It allowed me, you know, Congress had set up a vision. I took that vision and tried to carry it out. And again, it allowed me to take a lot of things off the table. It also protected me. I mean, I was very pleasantly surprised that, you know, I had a number of members of Congress and interest groups that all asked me to do things that weren't, you know, legal. And what I would say, that's a really interesting proposal, but I do not have the statutory authority to do that. Thank you. Nobody really said, well, you know, well, I did have a couple of members, I don't really name names in the book in this group, and a couple of members of Congress who did say, well, we don't care, you think you should do this anyhow, whether you, whether it's legal or not. But by and large, those interest groups really didn't kind of respond, you know, they didn't love it, but they accepted it. You know, few were really willing to say ignore the law, and they kind of just kind of sucked it up. But you can only do that if you mean it. I mean, once you develop a reputation as flexible and bend to the law, then then it's a nonstop negotiation all the time. Whereas my advice here is, if you're in these kind of positions and you develop a reputation from day one of like, I'm not going to second guess the law. We're going to carry it out. Then it becomes credible, and you know, people will respect that, and they'll just you know. They're, they're not going to. They're, they're no longer asking you to do things that are with, without the law. So that's that's my you know kind of article on constitutionalism. But you know I am very much at heart a Hyantian, and and I think that's reflected in the book. What I mean by that is the recognition of the importance of information and knowledge in any one situation. And so to me, I think the foremost characteristic of any good leader is humility. That whatever the situation is, you don't have all the information. You know, you, you're not going to be a central planner. You know, you're going to have to find and set up situations to gather as much information as you can, recognizing you're never going to see all the information. So, for instance, I tried to create a leadership team where people could very um, could challenge me or kind of give me a different perspective. And this is why I say the humility part of it is important. And in, in fact. Uh, I think my staff probably got tired of it, but one of my quips around the office was, um, I have more than sufficient confidence in my own opinions to pay someone to repeat them back to me. I pay people to tell me where I'm wrong, what I don't see. And I think the reason I say this is kind of a hierarchy in perspective is you do recognize that kind of dispersed knowledge and, and the difficulty of making planning in the in environment of uncertainty. So I made sure I had a, a senior leadership team and it had an environment and we really had a very open structure at the agency where I did want to make sure people could raise their hand. And so again, it's not a substitute for for prices in any sense of direction, but there are, you know, I guess I'd put it this way. Um, there's central planning done with humility. There's central planning done with ignorance. And, you know, they're both central planning, but I think one could be wor slightly worse than the other, if you will. Um, but it also meant that I spent a lot of time talking to people in the industry. You know, and again, not the same thing as price signals, but we took the price signals seriously. And it, and I think it did make sure that we had a bit of a modesty to it. So, um, again, there are really some lessons there I think you have to bring to it. And it also allows you, for instance, I mentioned earlier that, you know, the politics of the agency staff were obviously very different from mine. But the way I was able to get them to, to rally around me, if you will, is ground what I was doing in the law. You know, and grounded in the identity of what the agency was about. And again, this was at least an instance of where the purpose of the agency, which is constraining the moral hazard from the implied guarantees of Ralph and Freddie, are things that I agreed with and supported. So, uh, you know, obviously it'd be a much different situation as a libertarian if you're at an agency where you just deeply disagree with the purpose. That That's going to be a harder mission to pull off. But I think if there are things where you can relate to the purpose, I think there's a big difference you can make. And, and again, Communic importance of communication, importance of outreach, 
you know, these are many of the things. So particularly those later chapters, I think are applicable regardless of wherever you are in the federal government and not just the federal government. I think there were organizational lessons that would work um, for leadership in a, in a corporation. Yeah. I, you know, it, you mentioned one of the successes you were proud of in the book is, is improving the agency morale. And you mentioned the the polling uh, that showed that the the agency personnel was was much more content with the leadership of the agency and the the direction of the agency than they were before you got in. And as someone who who reads a lot of uh, uh, reports of the federal government, it, it's an it's not a great metric, but you know yeah, you can just somewhat yeah. use these these kind of personal sur- personnel surveys to show agencies where the personnel think they're actually doing something worthwhile, and uh, where they don't. And the agency could be doing something. Poorly, could be doing the wrong goal very well, which is a problem. Absolutely. But if Absolutely. we agree, if we agree on the goal being good, we want the agency personnel to think they're actually doing their job well. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, the, oh, go ahead. I was saying, part of the message, of course, if you come into this as a, as a sort of libertarian, free, you read know, a smart market person, how do you take your mission and use that as something where you can channel the agency? And as I say in the book, you know, if we can simply get agencies to live within the law. That, that's an accomplishment. <laughs> and it's probably a bigger accomplishment than many people realize. Yeah, it's uh, uh, the agencies don't tend to underestimate their power historically. It's it's probably uh, a big part of that uh, adhering to the Article 1 uh, that you mentioned is making sure just simply sticking to what their their, their duty is. Uh, and I think I, meant, I saw in the book, too, it was you were talking about getting the regular updates from industry. I believe it was the servicers where they were all asking for the servicer bailout. But when you called all of them, they said, yes, well, of course we need this, but I don't need it individually. Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I thought that's helpful context that you can hear the general uh, clamor for bailouts. But when you talk to them individually, no, no, I think I can make it. And, and that's what we saw, you know, and again, for each of them, they all looked at the bailouts as relatively like, well, you know, okay, you set up a facility and even if I don't use it, it's there, it's an option. And of course, as I remind people pretty regularly, you don't get a TARP bank bailout with not later getting a Dodd-Frank regulatory reaction. And I did remind the industry of like, yeah, be careful what you ask for. Washington never gives you anything for free. Well, and you also pointed out some of the problems with just the even pre-pandemic, the Federal Reserve buying so much of Fannie yeah. and Freddie's uh, mortgage-backed securities because that obviously takes down the demand or limits the, the demand to reform something if one part of the federal government is buying, buying all of the, the debt and liabilities of another. Uh, you did mention in the book the the mortgage REITs, the mortgage real estate investment trusts. Now, now was this an agent? This was this a situation where you did something that looked a little closer to a bailout, and that there was yep. some yep. sort of liquidity support there. And yep. why did you think that was more necessary? So, uh, you know, so REITs are a structure of the tax code. They're traditionally meant to be passive investment vehicles. You buy real estate, you collect the you know rent, you pay it out as dividends, and they're supposed to be equity supporting it. There's a small number of REITs, mortgage REITs, where they engage a little bit more in kind of an active trading strategy. They'll hold mortgage-backed securities, mortgage servicing rights. They'll fund it overnight repo market, you know, pledging the MBS as collateral. So it's a lot of duration mismatch. So they were seeing a lot of stress because the changes in interest rates by the Fed early in the pandemic really kind of blew up the value of their MBS and MSR mortgage service right holdings. And because REITs have to, they had 90% of their earnings, by structure, they're going to be heavily leveraged or else they lose their tax advantage. So I wasn't inclined to do anything, but um, Jay Powell calls me up and says, Mark, I'm really concerned about these REITs. We don't have a direct relationship with them, but Fannie and Freddie generally do because many of these REITs might originate or purchase mortgages and their collateral were generally, their balance sheets were generally Fannie Freddie mortgage-backed securities. So what the Fed asked us to do was, would we create a facility where Fannie and Freddie would provide essentially overnight repo funding where the collateral was their own debt? So Fannie would essentially lend against a Fannie and the yes overnight. Uh, and so, of course, I said to, to Chairman Powell, you know, we'll look at it and we'll think about it. And of course, I called uh, Jay Clayton, Chairman Clayton at the SEC, asked what he was seeing, and he was very worried about you know, the situation among the REITs, and there was putting a lot of pressure on the broker dealers and MBS. So ultimately, we decided to set up a facility, but we did what I what I would say, we went full budget at that. We actually charged a penalty rate. 
Uh, and, you know, it wasn't so much that it would blow it up, but it was so much where you weren't going to come here first. And so we so we set that up. It was very rarely used. Um, and we only set it up for a week to be able to get through kind of the worst of the situation where what Powell and, and even the SEC were asking for was, you know, just help these guys get to a few days so they could they could make their margin. And so, again, it was something where, okay, we're going to do this. We're not going to be generous about it. Um, and we're going to do it reluctantly to be team players. And and I do try to give a sense of the book of where there's that psychology of, of the pressure to go along and get along. And, and I don't think people really kind of understand how, how difficult it is very difficult in a room full of people who all want to do bailouts and you stand up and say, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, and so you pick your battles and some you say, I don't see the evidence. We're not going to do this. And some you say, well, maybe we'll do this, but we'll do it in a way that's not very attractive. Um, and so again, that's one where, you know, we did set up a, a, a very short term facility. And again, almost nobody used it, which was probably the right outcome. Uh, and but again, uh, to, to some extent, of course, it, it these decisions are tougher because, again, they're government-owned corporations. Even private corporations occasionally need to support their counterparties. Yeah. They have concerns about this. And so it seems like, once again, you're, of course, put in an uncomfortable situation where a government official was being forced to make a decision that maybe government officials shouldn't be the ones to make, typically. Absolutely correct. You know, we did try. I did try to make sure... And this goes to not just the assistance that might have been provided to Fannie and Freddie counterparties, but also to the borrowers, is we really approach this as, what would you do as a business? And so, for instance, you know, and some have countered, well, this proves that conservatorship works and government ownership of Fannie and Freddie should remain. I'm like, no, because you can look in, you know, the auto lending market, the credit card market. I mean, you saw similar levels of forbearance and assisted provided to auto loans where there is no auto GSE. Because it doesn't make it's not it's not business sense to for you're really going to try to take position of somebody's home in the middle of a pandemic when the courthouses are closed you're not going to be able to get a sheriff to put the person it's just impractical so we really tried to run this in a way as best as we could and I largely approached this with you know if I was the CEO of these companies you know how would I do this as a CEO would not as how a government official or a charity would. Uh, and again, you're obviously relieved of some constraints CEOs have to answer to shareholders and things like that. So it's never fully the same, but we never approach this as charity. We approach this as, you know, how do you minimize losses to a business and also to some extent being good corporate citizens during a pandemic. So I think you tried to balance those. But again, I 100% agree. None of this means you should have the government running it. Um, you know, if if anything, what you could take away is, you had somebody extremely knowledgeable about the situation who was f definitely very free market leaning, you know, who still probably says we should never put ourselves in these situations again, ever. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough because one of, uh, you know, some of the more diehard free market types would say, you know, let let the institutions fail, rub raw the wounds of discontent, and then people will realize uh uh, that things didn't work well and we'll get rid of them. But, uh, you know, I think you, like I, understand that's not how the politics of these works. I would much rather have these multi-trillion dollar companies uh, managed in, in the public interest and manage well than just kind of let them fail and, and hope people realize that the government in general is is uh, is not the, the right manager well, or conservative. You and, I, yeah, you and I are in the same camp of that because, you know, while you and I, I think very much agree that 2008 was not some failure of capitalism, it was a failure of bad government regulation. I mean, the public and the politicians largely didn't treat it that way. So, you know, you can't just assume that because things blow up and the government is partly responsible that people are going to react with less government. Um, and in fact, it almost always ends up being more government you know, I, I would go as far to say, I mean, I, I tell my friends who work on health care, you never would have gotten Obamacare if it hadn't been for the 2008 crisis of the TARP. And so I'm skeptical that letting government all blow up and markets go sideways is going to lead us to less government and markets. Well, it's especially... Yeah. What history suggests. Yeah, and especially because in this case, and this gets kind of, I think, the final question here is because the goal long term is to have these corporations be self-supporting. 
and to spend them off of the government, hopefully in a somewhat reduced form, and ideally with very minimal government uh, uh, sort of support. And so, so what? You, so making sure that they're in a good spot to do that, as opposed to sort of being in perpetual conservatorship, is so essential to this here. What do you think the prospects for that are, and the prospects for? Making a getting a mortgage market back that looks a little bit more like a free market than the current one we have now is. And so the one way is that we got close. That's exactly what I was trying to do before the pandemic and even during the pandemic, which is to do my best to turn Fannie and Freddie normal, normal-ish companies as much as you can. We got a lot of the ways there, and of course the pandemic hit and, and turned over, took over the agenda, and then of course the Supreme Court put me out of a job before I was done with that. So. But we we put a roadmap in place. I think it's unlikely that the Biden administration will do anything at all. I mean, they're not terribly interested. They don't see uh, the current situation as a problem. I overlapped six months with the Biden administration, had conversations with them, and they were all very polite and said that they thought we did a great job on forbearance. But they simply did not see risk in the in the status quo. They're not, eh, you know. So I'm I'm very pessimistic that anything's going to happen in that regard. But the plus is that, you know, after considerable amount of money spent on financial advisors and consultants, there are very extensive workable plans on the, on the bookshelf ready to go were there to be an administration that wants to do something. And unlike the situation we had where we had to wait for my predecessor to not, he didn't leave until 2019. So we had two years rather than four. I think a Republican administration coming in, the roadmap is there. And I think given the way the Biden administration has run, Fannie and Freddie is kind of a piggy bank. I think any Republican administration should come in and look at this and say, you know, we really do need to fix this. And given the roadmap and given what I've seen, it's doable in four years if you've got a team who wants to actually do it. Well, the book is Shelter from the Storm, How a COVID Mortgage Market Meltdown Was Avoided. Thank you so much, Mark, for being with us. Matt Judge, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did like what you heard on the podcast, please consider giving us five stars and writing a review on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And be sure to check out future episodes of Manhattan Insights.